we'll be in touch soon. All right, so um, our next speaker uh, is, who's, who's this guy? Who's, I don't know, forget. We invited him and he accepted. I'm not sure where yeah. he came from. No, uh, so Dr. David Stewart, uh, please, uh, you're welcome to unmute and uh, video yourself. Uh, hey guys. I can see, oh, hey, you have a camera. Me, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Who, who is with you? I, I have a, uh, my assistant who will be handling the PowerPoint uh, okay, good. this evening, who's right here. I have full, full faith in <laughs> his, 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 his capabilities. Those paws look very prehensile. Uh, so Dr. David Stewart is a uh, professor, uh, the uh, Linda Shilley Professor of Art History at uh, University of Texas at Austin, uh, has been working for a little bit in the Maya world mm -hmm. and a contributor uh, of Maya epigraphy since his most tender age. Uh, he is also a uh, co-founder and uh, the, the leader of the Boundary and Archaeology Research Center, a, uh, <laughs> a, a very awesome uh, not-for-profit um, that is kind of a sister nonprofit or, or, or brother nonprofit to AFAR that both uh, Matt and I also uh, help uh, work on. So uh, Dr. David Stewart is going to basically uh, grace us with kind of I guess his um, transformation, uh, historiographic, historiographic biography uh, of, of, of yeah. changes in, in Maya uh, historical archaeology, shall we call that? Uh, the, uh, the name of the, his presentation is Maya Archaeology and History, Personal Reflections on a Changing Field from 1980 to 2020. That marks two full uh, cartoons there. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Dave for joining us today, and uh, you have the floor. Well, th thank you, Max. Thank you, Matt. Good to see you guys. Uh, and also, thank you to Mallory and Jocelyn for their really great talks. Um, wonderful way to kind of segue into what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and uh, my presentation today, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, Please go ahead. <clears throat> make sure this works. Um, so I hope you can see that. Um, let me know, Max, if, if that's uh, okay. not, not quite visible. But um, yeah, so, so my presentation today is, this evening, is for me a bit unusual. Uh, I'm not going to be uh, presenting any new, you know, research or uh, decipherments of anything or analyses of iconography. Um, instead, you know, given the the topic that Max was uh, emailing me about uh, earlier in the summer, which was this idea of, a, of Maya archaeology as a historical archaeology or a type of historical archaeology, I, I thought I would um, offer some uh, reflections uh, based on, well, what Max just said, which is that, um, you know, I, I got an early start in this field back in the 1970s. Uh, and, um, you know, that's over 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, when Max brought up this topic, uh, which I think is a very interesting and important one, I very quickly went to this um, place in my mind thinking that, you know, back in 1977 or 1978 or, you know, thereabouts, uh, Maya archaeology was a very, very different uh, place, a different uh, field. And I wanted to uh, see if I could maybe bridge that particular era, uh, at least as I remember it, you know, as, as a pretty young person, uh, with where we are today. Uh, the transformation in my archaeology is, it goes without saying, right, has been uh, uh, just remarkable uh, in, in now uh, over four, uh, 40 years. And um, even when I was a graduate student in the very early 1990s, uh, I think, um, you know, we were wrestling with some of these changes that were coming almost in a weekly basis. And um, what do you think about that? I don't know. She will comment. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I thought it would be an opportunity to, to talk about um, the way the, the field has changed uh, since, you know, the late 70s, early 1980s. And, and even do a little bit of a deeper historiography uh, is, is a backdrop to that. So I, I, I have a, a number of slides. I'm going to get through this, I think, fairly, fairly quickly. But I do want to caution that I haven't really given a talk like this before where I'm 
reflecting on uh, kind of my own personal uh, background in all of this. Um, so, uh, you know, every person who has, and, and there are many of you, I think, who are even listening to this, um, you know, saw these changes, right? Saw these changes even from the 70s and 80s and, and later and, and have their own kind of take on it. So this one is mine, right? This one is, is kind of a, per, a particular kind of perspective. Um, so in the end, I, I think uh, when I wrap up uh, tonight, I'm going to maybe offer some kind of shallow reflections about where my archaeology is right now as opposed to where it was uh, uh, just uh, a couple of generations ago. So uh, I'm aging myself a little bit in this talk, but hey, um, that, that's, that's life, right? Um, so um, let's get into the slides. I thought I would start with this image. It's one of my favorite images from a particular era in Maya archaeology. Uh, this is a photograph taken at the site of Dos Pilas, Guatemala, by Ian Graham, uh, my old uh, co-worker and mentor in many ways. Uh, on the Corpus Project. And uh, he took this photograph in the very early 1960s, right when Dos Pilas was discovered. This was an era uh, when many sites were still being discovered. In fact, El Mirador, which was, was known at that time, Ian was really the first one to, to map it and really document it. Um, so it was a remarkable time in my archaeology, kind of bridging this old era of of raw exploration, much like Mahler and Maudsley, uh, with the more kind of scientific era of the new archaeology, right? So this, this was another kind of transformation that was taking place at the time. And, and I thought it would start with this image of the hieroglyphic stairway that, that he uh, documented. This is part of hieroglyphic stairway two at Dos Pilas, uh, now a very well-known historical inscription about a, a king named Baha Chancawil, who uh, Simon talked about last night. And uh, as you can see here, you know, finding a role for texts in history in Maya archaeology. Uh, one simple point to make right here is that in 1961 or 62, when this photograph was taken, I'm not sure exactly that year, um, there was no real history per se about Maya archaeology. It was right in the wake of Tatiana Proskurikov's famous paper from 1960, uh, which many of you know about which proposed the existence of names, of personal names and, and royal history in the monuments of Piedras Negras, right? So um, that was an idea that was transformational and quite radical at the time. But one of the things looking back on it is how long it took for that idea to stick, right? In the larger um, kind of methodologies of Maya archeology. span um, I, I think it took a good, um, couple of decades uh, almost for that um, to really merge well with, with archaeology. So this photograph encapsulates many of these ideas, right, because it comes at this very interesting time period. Um, there was no real role for texts in history in my archaeology, uh, let's say in 1960 or 1962. Um, beyond the old-fashioned, you know, documenting of texts, which Ian, of course, was a master at, uh, but, you know, the recording of dates, the reading of dates uh, in, in the way that Sylvanus Morley did for many decades, um, you know, that was the, in, in some ways still kind of the flavor of epigraphy uh, in, in this era, uh, despite the advances that were being made uh, by uh, Tanya and others. So, um, uh, I think it's one of those, those periods that's so interesting intellectually in intellectual history or historiography of, of uh, my archeology. span um, And taking a much broader perspective, right? And I don't want to you know, overstate things too much here, but, but the way I, I look at you know, where my archeology span was uh, in this period where there was a rather intense archaeological history, right? There were many sites that had been dug and there were, there, there were, there were um, you know, basic questions being asked about the Maya collapse in the 60s. Uh, there were basic questions about social process, basic questions about all sorts of things. But the texts at that point didn't really enter into a lot of that, right? Um, that came later. And uh, I see my archaeology as this very interesting illustration of a reversal of what 
had happened over a long period of time in the old world, especially in the Mediterranean, in classical archaeology, for example, where, you know, in Egypt, uh, in the study of ancient Greece and ancient Rome, um, text-based analyses or texts, uh, epigraphy, really came in many ways earlier than the archaeology, right? Uh, so the ability to read Egyptian uh, inscriptions in uh, the early 1800s or mid-19th century, that was well before any kind of serious archaeology in Egypt. And so uh, I, it, that created a certain dynamic in those fields, uh, in the world of classics, right? In the world of Egyptology, that, that those fields are even still st struggling with in many ways, I think. Um, but Maya archaeology is sort of the flip of that, right? Um, there was a, uh, not a very long period, but, but an extended period of serious uh, archaeology well before uh, the inscriptions were legible, before they were readable. Uh, and I think this created a certain um, amount of, well, there were tensions in the field, certainly as a result of that there was its own dynamic that, uh, you know, maybe some of the younger generation of my archaeologists today weren't that aware of, but I was certainly aware of them, and I think others were in the 1970s and 1980s in particular. Uh, a real tension between epigraphy on one side, archaeology on the other, and I don't really want to overstress this, but, you know, I do remember that there were some uh, some arguments that went on at conferences and in other places about some of this stuff. And, and, and some of those were, were persistent uh, uh, debates about the relevance of history, the relevance of epigraphy and broader interpretations. Another thing to keep in mind along the same lines here is that Maya archaeology in the very early days, in the early 20th century, talking here 1910, you know, uh, the, the first decades, uh, and, and you can track it back, of course, earlier to the Harvard project at Kulpan in the 1890s and, and so forth. But the Kirigua project I see is a very important uh, kind of historical theoretical uh, episode in Maya studies. Um, this was a, uh, a project that began around 1910 um, and uh, it was uh, organized uh, kind of with the cooperation of several institutions. It was funded by the, uh, uh, really by the banana industry, right? The, um, uh, you know, Kirigua being right in the middle of the United Fruit Company lands, right? So they funded this project. Uh, it was very colonialist, if you want to use a, a kind of modern spin on it and, and analysis of it. Uh, and, and Sylvanus Morley, you know, the, the great epigraphic figure, archaeological figure in Maya studies, was uh, very much a part of that early, early project. Uh, another person who was involved was Edgar Lee Hewitt. Um, and Morley and Hewitt, um, you know, some, some people know this well, uh, others maybe not so much. Uh, both Morley and Hewitt were uh, really by training Southwestern archaeologists, right? They came from North America. Uh, they were uh, training at the School of American Research in Santa Fe, which was really being established in those years uh, and a little bit later. And um, you, you can track, in other words, some of the uh, firm roots of Maya field archaeology back to the American Southwest in this area. So, so this is why I call Maya by Southwest. It, it's you know, uh, the seeds of, of many uh, of, of the major institutions and players in my archaeology came from uh, North America. Why is this relevant? Well, the reason I'm bringing this up is because uh, the tradition of North American archaeology um, in 1910 and also in 2010 uh, is in many ways not really that comfortable with the idea of history, right? North American archaeology uh, began, uh, its foundations began in this kind of ahistorical perspective, okay? Uh, so uh, it, it almost existed as a, uh, a counterpart to the old world um, text-based, epigraphic kind of focused classical archaeology. Um, I, I'm kind of oversimplifying this intellectual history in a big way, but I, I would say that this connection to North American intellectual history and archaeology uh, through Harvard, through the School of American Research, um, through some other institutions is quite important, right? And, and it's what happens later in terms of 
uh, some of these tensions, right, that come some decades later uh, between uh, the dialogue of history and archaeology. Um, so uh, again, just to review here, there, there's a huge shift, as I mentioned, um, right after mid-century. Um, these are three players that I uh, would like to, to focus on uh, or, or mention. Uh, Heinrich Berlin, uh, Tatiana Proskuryakov, and David Kelly. Um, I mentioned Proskuryakov, right? She's, she's uh, very famous because of her analysis of the Piedras Negras monuments and, and the identification of rulers' names and rulers' events and life events. Uh, that was in 1960. But before that, um, Heinrich Berlin had published some remarkable, uh, very insightful articles about the identification of personal names uh, in Maya inscriptions and emblem glyphs, right? The, the identification of these titles, these, these possible place names that we now know are, are, are the designations for royal courts and royal dynasties. Um, but Berlin, I think, deserves a bit more credit than maybe he gets for helping to set the stage for uh, this, this paradigm shift. It's interesting that both Berlin and Proskuryakov were together in the field on the Mayapan project uh, in the 1950s uh, up in Yucatan, right? So I, I suspect they were in dialogue with each other about many of these ideas. And um, uh, Proskuryakov, you know, really had had a baseline from which to work with, you know, in her work in 1960. Uh, maybe surprising to some, I would include also David Kelly in this. Uh, why, why include Dave? Uh, well, Dave, shown here with Peter Matthews, uh, who was his student at the University of Calgary, his undergraduate student. Uh, Dave was, I think, a really important for a couple of reasons. He very famously uh, was an early advocate for the phonetic decipherments of Yuri Konorosov, right? Um, uh, he, he was almost like a lone voice in this idea that Maya writing was phonetic in, in some of its structure and advocated for Konorosov's basic methodology. Um, even though we know now that, uh, that, that Konorosov was wrong about a bunch of his readings, uh, um, you know, the vast majority of his actual decipherments turned out not to be correct, but, but Kelly knew that he was onto something. Uh, the other thing that Dave Kelly did, though, was he followed up immediately on Proskuryakov's ideas by uh, analyzing, for example, in a paper that he wrote just a couple of years later on the rulers of Kirigua that site that Hewitt and Morley had, had worked on uh, just five decades before. And that was, I think, important in, in showing that this methodology could be applied elsewhere, right? So, uh, you know, the, the early 60s, Ian is in the field, he's documenting Dos Pilas and a bunch of other sites. You know, this is when this historical paradigm is emerging, but keep in mind, there are so few scholars who are actually doing this at the time, right? It's just a handful of people. There's no email, there's no internet. Uh, you know, communication is a bit, you know, tricky sometimes, I think. Uh, but nevertheless, it, it helps plant what happens later. Now, the other thing I want to mention here is the T. Call project, okay? So concurrent with this, in fact, right when Ian is beginning his explorations in the Maya lowlands in Guatemala, especially, the University of Pennsylvania begins its t -call project in the late 50s, uh, 56 or so with Ed Shook. Uh, and uh, for a well over a decade is doing a lot of field work. <clears throat> and um, it's, it remains today, I think, one of the great excavations in all of my archeology. span um, But remember that the Penn project, when it was going strong, you know, if you go back and read the articles in Expedition Magazine, or if you read the reports, uh, most of them, there's very little reference to history. There's very little reference to rulers, rulers' names or reigns or, or anything like that. It's, it's rather old school, you know. Uh, Ed Shook goes back to the Carnegie days uh, of Mayapan and, and the Washington Project, right? So th there's that bridge back to the early days of Maya archeology. span um, I think the 60s are this interesting illustration of, you know, archaeology on one side that is kind of continuing along in a certain pathway. And then you have this new epigraphy, this new paradigm of history. They're not necessarily coming together at this point at all, right? That takes some time. 
and you know the excavations are sort of winding down uh, at, uh, at at Pennsylvania uh, at Tikal, uh, and you know they're doing these deep excavations, very Carnegie style, you know old style deep excavations, moving a lot of earth, tearing down pyramids even, uh, and uh, you know they find all these burials. They find this deep archaeological. Uh, uh, sequence in the North Acropolis, especially, which uh, you see at the top of that slide there. Uh, and this is that trench through the North Acropolis, rather famous in my archaeology, um, all the way back into the late Preclassic, right? So bridging centuries and centuries of time. Uh, some projects had done a little bit of this. Washaktun is a good example, but Tikal, uh, you know, really uh, helped frame my archaeology for, for a long, long time based on this chronological approach. Uh, but it's a very ahistorical, it's a very non-historical approach uh, uh, to, to Tikal itself. Um, now, I was uh, barely uh, able to contribute to that project. Um, in 1968, I visited Tikal. Um, here I am looking at Temple One. Uh, I, I, I could have contributed, but they wouldn't really listen to me. I was only three years old. So, um, you know, it, it was a lost opportunity uh, on their part. But, but hey, uh, there I was uh, kind of soaking in Temple One. Uh, and uh, that was a, quite a memory. I, that's, I think my earliest actual memory is Temple One of Tikal. Um, so, so now we're getting into my, <laughs> my biography here. Uh, just a sneak preview. Uh, two people I do want to mention, though, in relation to Tikal. Uh, uh, Clemency Coggins and also Christopher Jones, uh, names that may be familiar to you. Um, and, and you see there a slide of a, a royal tomb, uh, one of many found by the Penn Project, right, with a long count date painted on the wall. Um, now, um, Chris was one of the first in the mid-1970s. He was on the Penn Project, right? He, he knew Tikal like nobody else. And working with the inscriptions and documenting them, he identified uh, three rulers' names in uh, the inscriptions, three late classic rulers. Uh, he called them ruler A, B, and C in, in a, a very famous paper in, in American antiquity. Uh, and he was spot on about that. He was using Proskuryakov's methods. And I think that's a really nice example in the 70s of where epigraphy and archeology span start to come together, right? Um, another person who's important with regard to the Penn Project is Clemency Coggins. She was not in the field so much with Penn, but she was Tatiana Proskuryakov's uh, student at Harvard. And Tanya was very aware of what was going on at Tikal, and Clemency wrote a really important dissertation in 1975, I think, or 76, on uh, called the Painting and Drawing Styles of Tikal. Uh, which sounds very art historical. It was an art history dissertation. But what she does in that dissertation is she, much like Chris, you know, she's, she's framing all of this in terms of, of actual rulers of Tikal. And, and what she's doing is she's channeling Tatiana Proskuryakov's insights about Tikal history. Um, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. But Tanya was, you know, after her Pieters Negris paper, she was still working on Maya history she just wasn't publishing a lot of articles. Uh, many of her insights come through uh, Clemency, they come through Joyce Marcus, uh, other students who are going through Harvard, uh, especially in the early 1970s. Um, so there's a really interesting situation here, right? Um, you know, the 1970s are a really fascinating time where you have the, the, the inklings of, of of a convergence of methods, right? Where epigraphy and archeology span can, or history and archeology span can start to uh, talk to each other, you might say. Uh, but I would say it's still not really well formed. Um, and uh, 1980 to me, more or less, is an important uh, kind of turning point here. Uh, I, I say here, bipolar Maya research before 1980. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that you still have these two different realms, you might say, methodologies. Epigraphy, history is starting to talk with archaeology, but it's not really well formulated. And it might just be, uh, you know, an example here, an example there. 
I, I do think Tikal is really key in this. Um, and uh, of course, uh, the other project that's so important uh, in all of this, as I'll talk about in a second, is Palenque. But let me illustrate this, right? Let me illustrate this, this disconnect, you might say, uh, with, with looking at some important publications before 1980, right before 1980. Um, these are our books that are, are probably well known to, to many of uh, the grad students out there and archeologists. Uh, Social Process in Maya Prehistory in 1976, Prehistoric Mesoamerica by Dick Adams in 1977, and Maya Archaeology and Ethnohistory in 1979. Now, I point these out because they're using uh, this idea of prehistory to describe the classic Maya, right? Um, and, and that last book there, the 1979 publication, is not my archaeology and history, it's my archaeology and ethnohistory, which is really looking at more the colonial documents and that kind of thing, right? So, so this is an era when there is still no widespread acknowledgement that, that ancient history exists as its own kind of complex texture of evidence that can be applied to archaeological interpretation. They're, they're, they're still rather divided um, and this changes very quickly, but but I think the, the late 70s, the disco era, right, is, is kind of the time frame for, for some of these tensions uh, to start to play themselves out. So prehistory, we don't use prehistory anymore to talk about the Maya, unless we're maybe talking about the late preclassic or something, but um, but here we are, you know, uh, it, it's commonly used, it's, it's almost like a reflex to talk about prehistory when we're talking about the, the pre-conquest period. Uh, this does change very quickly. Now, uh, a nice illustration of the, the change that does happen is Priskiriakov's book uh, of, called Maya History, right? And this is a manuscript that's sitting around. Um, you know, Tatiana Priskiriakov passes away. She dies in 1986. Um, this is not published until the mid-1990s. Uh, and, and so people don't necessarily see it or absorb it. Uh, but she was working on a book called Maya History that really just didn't see the light of day. It's kind of unfortunate. I, I suspect she was writing much of this uh, maybe not long after her Pieter Snegris uh, article, right? Looking uh, probably in the late 60s and throughout the 70s, she's really working on this manuscript, but it doesn't really uh, appear until after her death, which is very unfortunate. I think things might have changed a bit if, if that wasn't the case. Um, uh, so, some of you may be wondering, why am I not talking about Palenque, right? Uh, well, here we go. I'm going to talk about Palenque. Palenque is important, uh, the, the scholarship at Palenque in this era. But I would say still that in, in 1980, we, we do still have this rather significant divide. I remember it well from, you know, being at conferences in that time period between archeology span and epigraphy. Um, now, of course, needless to say, as many of you know, uh, the, some of the great transformations that took place in Maya studies happened at Palenque in the early 70s, you know, right, kind of on the, on the heels of the Tikal project and, and um, you know, right when Chris Jones, Clement T. Coggins are working. Uh, uh, and, and certainly we have at Palenque this new energy that appears, right? Uh, the first Mesa Redonda in 1973 is a major uh, event. Um, and uh, uh, this is one of a few photographs I know of, of that uh, really important meeting. Uh, there's Betty Benson standing uh, from Dumbarton Oaks, right? She was an important organizer uh, and, and kind of energy behind this, along with Merle Green Robertson uh, and Mike Coe of Yale University, uh, Gillette Griffin, who's there in the foreground, um, and of course, uh, Linda Sheely was there, Peter Matthews, uh, a lot of people were there, Jeff Miller, um, very important young scholars as well, who, who I think were catching the wave, right? They're catching this energy. Um, of course, Linda and Peter, you know, they were the ones who, who really crystallized this newfound approach uh, of looking at inscriptions at, as history. And, and this is important, right? Uh, Peter Matthews, as we saw, Peter was Dave Kelly's student, 
right? Peter knew uh, what was going on, uh, you know, through his own academic track. He, he was aware from, from Dave of, of these major kind of changes happening. And, and uh, they were studying uh, the inscriptions of Palenque. They were using Heinrich Berlin's early work uh, and, and kind of distilling that into a, a, a much stronger reconstruction of the dynasty of Palenque, which they announced at the first Mesa Redonda. And, and I remember, you know, I, I wasn't there. Believe me, I was not there. Uh, I would have been, what, eight years old or something. Um, uh, but I remember my, my mom and dad went to the first Mesa Redonda, Palenque, my dad, George Stewart, my mom, Jean Stewart. And I do remember them coming back from that conference being super jazzed and super excited. Uh, even though I had no idea what, you know, my archaeology was all about. They, they, were, they were clearly communicating to, to me and us kids that, hey, this trip was great, all these new finds and so forth. And, you know, Linda and Peter, as, as we all know, were, were the ones who were really channeling that. Um, I, I also want to broaden out this a little bit, though, because the, the, the Mesa Redonda of Palenque, was uh, really energized, uh, as I mentioned, by Betty Benson, uh, Merle Green Robertson. Uh, Michael Coe is very important in all of this. Of course, Mike passed away just uh, recently. Um, and uh, another participant in the Mesa Soridondas for a number of years was Floyd Lounsbury. And, um, you know, I think because Linda and Peter were, were so junior, they were so young, they didn't have, you know, graduate degrees, right? They were they were kind of the young Turks of the field. They, some people use that term even. Um, Floyd and Mike were the established academics, right? And Floyd and Mike were the ones who were, I uh, think, uh, uh, blessing that work. And Floyd, of course, worked very closely with Linda and Peter. Uh, Mike was not an epigrapher, uh, but he was very interested in what was going on with epigraphy. Uh, and this is a, a, a term that, um, nobody uses anymore, but I remember it being used quite often, which was that this was the Yale school of Maya epigraphy, right? Uh, because of Mike and Floyd being sort of the patrons of this uh, with, with Linda and, and Peter uh, beneath them in, in a sense, you know, just in terms of age and so forth. Uh, the Yale school was sort of a blanket term used in the 70s for this sort of new wave of epigraphy. Uh, looking at, at history and, and looking intensively, especially at Palenque. Palenque was the focus of that. Um, you know, Mike Coe tells the story in his, his book uh, very well, uh, Breaking the Maya Code. Uh, there's a lot about the history of Maya epigraphy that's not in that book, however. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I might want to flesh that out a little bit. Um, I was not at the first Mesa Redonda, but I was at... Um, uh, Gosh, I don't even remember. I think I was at the third one. That was my first one in 1978. And here I am with Linda, who I developed a very close relationship with uh, in these years, with my dad and with John Justison. Um, this was when I gave my first paper at Palenque. And I won't get into how I got into this field. Uh, you know, that's, that's a long story in and of itself. But here I am um, uh, enjoying myself with all these remarkable scholars and, and, and developing very close friendships with, with many of them. Um, that same year, by the way, was when I attended the very first Maya workshop at, at Austin, here in Austin, uh, in 1978, uh, that Linda was invited to present by Linda, by, by Nancy Troike uh, at the Latin American Institute at Texas. And uh, here you see the, the cover of the notebook for that, right? And it's a Palenque inscription. Palenque was, was the, e, the be all and end all of Maya my epigraphy, at least, at this era, right? Um, every Texas workshop for a number of years, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, was only Palenque, right? And uh, I, I think that's kind of an interesting take on, on this era as well. Um, and, and I was working with Linda um, on all sorts of different projects, uh, you know, on Palenque, on a book we were going to write on Maya glyphs, which never appeared. Uh, but which really um, got my interning about a lot of decipherments and, and kind of the structure of the script. Here we are visiting uh, Peter Matthews at Harvard uh, on the steps of the Peabody Museum. Uh, I think with one of uh, 
uh, or a couple of, of Ian Graham's field drawing notebooks there. And that's one in my lap and we're talking about inscriptions. Um, so jumping ahead, okay. Um, believe me, this will kind of, you know, come to a, to a, I, I hope a narrative pretty soon. My own history in all of this, right? Non-academic, right? I'm, I'm a kid, right? I'm a teenager. Um, and I'm not, I'm not even viewing this as an academic discipline. I'm just like, I just love hieroglyphs and I love my archaeology. But I do eventually end up um, in, in the field uh, on my own uh, with projects, right, as a student. And the site of Copan is really key in all of this. Uh, I um, started working on Copan material in around 1984. Um, Copan was, for me as a, as a young student trying to learn Maya hieroglyphs uh, in the late 70s and very early 80s, Copan was super hard. It was very impenetrable. Uh, the, the inscriptions were so complicated visually. Um, and, and so when Linda and I were working together on this book on Maya, uh, ancient Maya writing was gonna be called, um, I decided to kind of dive into the Copan material and, and try to work out some things for myself and read up on it. And uh, what happened here was uh, kind of an interesting thing. Um, it, well, let me go back here. I, I, eventually, you know, the work at Copan, where Linda and I were working, this is where history, I think, really came into play in my archaeology, right? And it was especially in the late 80s. Uh, so, so what's the background for this? Well, when I was playing around with the Copan uh, monuments and, and inscriptions. Um, you know, reading what little had been written about the uh, dynastic history, you know, Dave Kelly had identified rulers' names. Uh, uh, there were, uh, Bertolt Risa had identified some rulers' names. Uh, and Alter Q, this amazing monument was of course really important. Um, but I had been working on um, some of the early dynastic history. I wanted to show you all here, just kind of a lark, I guess. Uh, this is my notebook from 1984, where I'm identifying this uh, particular ruler called Yashkukmo, um, and proposing that he was actually uh, maybe even the first ruler of the kingdom. Uh, and uh, I remember writing a long letter to uh, a young archaeologist named Bill Fash uh, about my interpretations of the dynastic history of Copan. And Bill, uh, I met Bill at the AAA meetings uh, the following year in DC where I was living. And we hit it off and uh, Linda uh, got involved. And uh, they, uh, Bill Fash and his wife Barb, invited me and Linda down to Copan in the summer of 1986. Uh, and they were starting something called the Copan Mosaics Project. Uh, so here are Linda and me. I look like I'm about 40 years old because I had a, a scraggly beard here, but I'm only, I think about, God, I don't know, 20, 21 years old. Uh, uh, not even that, gosh, I don't know. I can't do the math, but there's me and Linda uh, together in the Hotel Marina in Copan uh, that summer. And it, just seeing the inscriptions at Copan, my first time there, it was a remarkable uh, thing. It was a, a remarkable um, experience. A lot of made sense all of a sudden. And um, the dynastic history became very clear. Uh, so we worked really closely. Here I am pointing uh, at uh, altar Q. That's an altar. That's a big, big stone I'm pointing at. A very awkward photo, right? Uh, <laughs> there I am uh, with uh, the, the Yashkukmo right behind my arm and the 16th ruler Yashpasa that I'm pointing to. Uh, you all know altar Q probably in its story, but it was really a, a, the armature for understanding the dynastic history. Uh, Bill and Barb were uh, wonderful in accommodating epigraphic knowledge in the interpretations of Copan archaeology. Another important person who came, came a few years later to Copan was Bob Scherer from the University of Pennsylvania, who had worked at Tikal, worked at Kirigua, and he, Bill Fashion invited Bob to come uh, investigate the earlier levels of the Acropolis of Copan. Uh, and to do tunneling. Um, and, and this uh, emerged as a remarkable project in and of itself. One of the things that drove this project, I think in Bill's mind, was that we have this dynastic history. We have this first ruler named Kinichiash Kukmo, but we had absolutely no archeological evidence for him. 
Uh, and there was a real question in, in the 1980s as to whether Yash Kukmo was a real human being or a mythical founder, or, you know, someone who, who really uh, was made up by later Maya historians. We actually had these discussions, right, uh, at the time. I, I was convinced he was real, uh, but others did not. And um, remarkably, uh, Bob, in a, in a few short years, was able to prove the veracity of the written history. Um, you know, the discovery of the margarita uh, stucco here with the emblem name of Yash Kukmo. Um, this created a really interesting dynamic, right? So that uh, we had several concurrent field projects that it eventually ended up at Copan. Um, after the Copan Mosaics project, we had Ricardo Agurcia digging in Temple 16. We had uh, uh, Bill, uh, Will Andrews working uh, in, the, in the southern part of the site. Uh, Linda is there, and this is our meeting in Santa Fe at the School of American Research, right, where my archaeology can kind of trace its DNA. And, and here we are, uh, Rebecca Story, David Webster, uh, a lot of, you know, just, we're all talking about Copan, and, and history is a big part of the interpretations. So a lot of stuff is gelling at this point. This is where I get my, uh, my experiences in my uh, archaeology uh, in the late 80s. Um, uh, my Buddy Joel Palka, who was on the crew back then, this is his excavation crew. Hello, everyone. Um, I think he did. He, he did, did too. Okay. We may have lost a uh, connection from uh, Dr. Stewart. It looks like this is uh, something that uh, could have happened. Um, Actually, let, let, text David. Yeah, I, I'm going to call him. He may be. He, <laughs> he's probably still talking. <laughs> I'm going to call David. Yeah. Ask him to reconnect. Uh, the kind of thing that can happen in these uh, conferences. Now you can see the behind the scene of Maya the Playa web edition. No. Hey, Dave, uh, I think we lost you. Uh, Any more? Uh, I don't know what happened. So can you uh, try to uh, um, reuse, yeah, you, you, and can you, okay, Clay, I just hit, I don't know what happened. You may have like lost internet for like a hot, hot second and. Yep. All right, there you are. There we go. All right, you're back in. Yeah, we can see you. <laughs> Excellent. You're doing great, Dave. <laughs> it's a great talk. Looking for the second part. Looking forward to the second part. Okay, you're oh, muted. You're muted now. Sorry, everyone. All I'm right. Back. I'm back. My internet phased out. Okay. So we uh, were hearing about Copan. Share my screen again. Yeah. I'll get back to where I was. Um, I'm droning on too long. I'm sorry, guys. No, I'm no, 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 no. You're good. You have plenty of time. You're so, good. Um, can you all see that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so I just wanted to mention we're still plugging along on Copan material that goes back to the 80s uh, and, and, and the history archaeology convergence is going strong there. Now I'm just I'm going to uh, go very quickly through this. Uh, I just wanted to mention in my own personal history after Copan, I uh, went to grad school uh, at Vanderbilt. I joined the uh, Patesh Batun Archaeological Project. Uh, and uh, the site of Dos Pilas was, I think, a place where I saw many of these ideas uh, that I was thinking about at Copan really crystallizing beautifully also. It, it a site that was relatively unknown, 
right? Unlike Copan, Copan had been excavated for a long, long time. And, and I wanted to mention here that the work that led up to that project was spearheaded by Steve Houston, um, who did his dissertation on Dos Pilas. And he went to Vanderbilt and the project really started really uh, from his observations about, about the dynastic history, who he had worked with Peter Matthews on, on some of this, in fact, earlier, so there's another connection. And, uh, you know, Steve, I think, illustrates this, uh, this really uh, powerful convergence of archaeology and epigraphy. Um, uh, you know, a lot of us who work in this material, I, I get this all the time, you know, oh, Dave, you're an epigrapher. You're just an epigrapher. I get that sometimes, too. You know, Steve is an archaeologist, and he's an epigrapher. He's a, a lot of things. Um, I, I think a lot of us who do this are a lot of things, too. Uh, <laughs> But uh, I just wanted to point out this kind of, you know, importance of Steve in, in, in that project and in, again, uh, uh, merging these two highways. And, and Vanderbilt, you know, that was a great time for us. Uh, there were a lot of students who went through the project in those years. Uh, uh, you know, Joel Palka, who was on Copan with me. There's Takeshi Inomata, uh, Osvaldo Chinchilla, Barbara Arroyo, Sonia Medrano. You know, a bunch of uh, archaeologists, pretty well established now, uh, you know, went through that program. We all went together and we were working, uh, many of us at Dos Pilas together. Uh, so, you know, this was a big learning experience. And I think just intellectually, a very important time where uh, epigraphy and, and field archaeology came together, um, even more than in Copan in some ways. Uh, I lost a lot of weight uh, hiking around the jungle in those years, uh, very skinny, like I, I certainly am not now. Um, and, you know, we discovered new inscriptions at Dos Pilas that helped frame a lot of later historical interpretations, in fact. The, this hieroglyphic stairway that was found at Dos Pilas, uh, Stairway 4, in 1990, really helped uh, us understand broader geopolitics in Maya history, including the Canuls, the Snake Kingdom, and, and all of that. You know, it was really the, the moment, you know, for me and Steve and, and for Simon, in Nicola Gruba, you know, where we kind of realized, hey, you know, there's, there's a lot going on here in terms of geopolitics and hierarchies. Uh, I, I should mention too, Palenque being really important. Uh, this is a shorter kind of smaller project that I was involved with with Alfonso Morales, but Alfonso worked at Copan as well, right? He worked with Bob Scherer uh, on the early Acropolis project, and he had the opportunity to direct excavations in Temple 19. Uh, at, at uh, Palenque, where uh, was discovered several amazing tablets, right? And, and, and this was a way also of kind of framing archaeology through a historical lens in a very direct way, um, maybe even overly historicized. Uh, uh, you know, there, there was probably a lot of archaeology we could have done if we had the opportunity there uh, in, in that particular part of the site. Um, uh, looking at, you know, the history of the structure and, and kind of the, the kind of archaeology that Jocelyn was doing, for example, at La Corona. But, uh, but hopefully that can be done um, in other, uh, uh, other buildings at Palenque. Uh, La Corona, I won't go over this because Jocelyn did such a wonderful job of talking about the history of this, but La Corona was another place where this stuff converges. And uh, here we have uh, me uh, and Ian Graham in 97 when we you know, kind of go through and, and document the monuments there, uh, the Saknite, identifying it as Site Q and so forth. And I want to mention that Marcello, you know, who started the project uh, after Ian and I were there several years, he starts the excavations at, at La Corona. Um, of course, he was Bob Scherer's student working at Copan, right? This is important. This is an intellectual track, right, from, from this historicized Maya archaeology, it comes down into uh, other sites, right, in Guatemala, much like Dos Pilas, right, much like uh, other ones as well. Uh, the Caracol project, I didn't mention that, that's also very important because Steve Houston had been there earlier uh, in Belize uh, before he was at Dos Pilas, uh, so I wanted to mention uh, the importance of the Caracol project as well, but I didn't work there, right, this is my personal take on some of this stuff. So working with Marcello, working with Jocelyn, working with Tomas, uh, you know, uh, La Corona is a place of just endless fascination. Um, and uh, Jocelyn did a great job. And I'm not going to even talk more about that. Uh, the 2012 block, um, she described 
an incredible moment, it's true. And so much, you know, little tidbits of my history have come out of that particular excavation that Jocelyn oversaw. Um, so, you know, the point here is that, you know, we've been working together, you know, we, we, we who kind of focus on Maya hieroglyphs, um, uh, Simon, me, Steve, Mark Zender, many others, right? And uh, this is an ongoing team effort in many ways, but we're, we're involved with lots of different projects, you know, kind of spread out all over the Maya world. And, you know, the, the, the uh, La Corona being one of them, Copan being another, right? We're, we're all kind of working in many ways on this uh, still and, and writing up old results uh, still. Uh, and new discoveries keep happening, right? Here's Max. I wanted to show Max, right? Here's Max and Marcello uh, with uh, discoveries at La Corona a few years ago. And, and a wonderful illustration of what I'm talking about here, um, and I promise I will shut up pretty soon. Um, uh, Marcello uh, and, and Max and others on the La Corona project have really looked at the chronology of that site in terms of royal history, right? In terms of actual reigns of kings. Um, there, there's not direct correspondence all the time, uh, but, but notice here, for example, in the palace of La Corona, the, the construction phases of the palace correspond very nicely with historical reigns we know from the epigraphy, right? And, and to some extent, the, the, the ceramic phases do as well. Uh, Steve Houston tracked some of these same interrelationships at Piedras Negras, especially with ceramics. Uh, being, you know, tying them into historical reigns, right? So, so that's really important. Finally, I wanted to mention one of the projects I'm working on right now is this, you know, one of the most impressive of Maya sites, Shultun, uh, near San Bartolo, right? It, it is immense. Uh, and it has some of the latest Maya monuments and it has some early Maya monuments. Because of preservation, because of, you know, bad luck, perhaps, we don't know a lot about the history of Shultun. And we don't know how it really ties in well to these other kingdoms, these networks of, you know, the, the, the snake kingdom, the Kanuls and, and Tikal and others. But um, it, it, it's a limitation that we have, you know, so it will be an interesting case study of, in my archaeology, of, of how we can link it uh, to other kinds of data, right? Not relying on epigraphy or not, not necessarily bringing epigraphy in all the time. Uh, and I think that's important to point out, right? It's not just about glyphs. It's not just about inscriptions and royal history. There's a lot uh, of other things as well. So finally, um, um, a, a broader point this is my last slide. Um, I don't think my archeology span is a historical archeology. span um, in the way we often think of that expression. Um, I see it as something a bit more complicated. Uh, you know, as I say here, um, it's broader and richer than that. Uh, there's a, a, a constellation of approaches, right? Um, and, you know, where we have historical sources and inscriptions, certainly that keys into the data, but it's not always going to be there. Uh, so uh, Jocelyn made this point as well, right? We have to go beyond epigraphic data to look at, at a lot of broader questions. I guess my main point here is that this change that we've seen in the last 40 plus years, uh, it, it's one that's really unique in, in American archeology. span uh, This may be obvious to some folks, but um, nowhere else outside of the old world, outside of the Mediterranean world or maybe China, can we talk about long-term history? Can we talk about, uh, you know, uh, many, many centuries of dynastic history and, and tie it into these other kinds of, of information? I think the, the closest thing we can really link Maya studies to is something like classics, right? The cla you know, which is this very kind of, it, it's an old field that is trying to transform and come out of itself, <laughs> you know, on the other side. But, but I think Maya archeology span in a funny way is, is approaching what classics is or was, or, you know, or, or maybe we're kind of coming together in some ways, but, but that's, I'm going to stop right there because it's way too long. Uh, and, and I apologize for that, but uh, I will uh, now stop sharing my screen. And uh, thanks to you all. I'm sorry I went over folks. Oh, here we are.
Uh, David, do not worry. This was a great <laughs> presentation, and you were not even over time. No. You were I'm on, not okay. All right, on the spot. You're good. You're, right. good. you're good. You're good. My cat left, by the way. I don't know. Where. Oh, but that's maybe that's why you're you're angry. But no, <laughs> I'm joking. No, no, it's it's perfect. Actually, we have ten full minutes. Okay. For, uh, for question good. answers before our uh, next uh, slated talk, which, by the way, we just uh, realized. Uh, we will not have Christoph personally introduce his, his film, but we we have a premiere film here right now to present uh, from Christoph uh, in, uh, at eight. Oh, is he not presenting or, or is he? he? No, he's sleeping. He's sleeping because it is like 3 a.m. Yeah, not bad. Denmark. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, he sent us a very cool film to share. We have a question here but by... You, you didn't Donald. let me do that? Uh, say what? You didn't let yeah. me do that? No, yeah, we didn't let you because because uh, you, you don't have the you don't have the three a.m. argument. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> Thank you, though. That was actually a really good cool <laughs> talk. And uh, no, no, seriously, uh, it's it's really cool. Those photos were were uh, were really precious. A lot of them. And, yeah, I want to thank I want to thank uh, Joel Palka and Marcello for sending me some photos at very short notice, and okay. Elaine Sheely also. Awesome. So, awesome. yes. Yeah, no, I think I think at some point there will uh, there will be a, a dire need for a new uh, breaking the Maya code uh, version kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, there does need to be that. Mm -hmm. I agree. Cool. I wonder who could write it. Uh, anyway, so uh, <laughs> no, I don't want to add, add anything to your list. Uh, I have personal uh, stake in this. Uh, so uh, let's go. And uh, there's a first question here by uh, someone named anonymous attendee, who says, "Wonderful talk, Dave." Just a brief shout out for another figure important in the 1970s and later, Will Andrews. Although not a figure for himself, rather an archetypal dirt archaeologist, he invited various building and figurefers, budding and figurefers, sorry, to speak at Tulane, such as Linda, before she moved to Texas, whom he also put up at his house. Will, as editor of the Mari Publications, was receptive to publishing work on iconography, a figure for Absolutely. history, yeah. such as work by Clemency Coggins, Vicky Bricker, and others. Perhaps this was due in part to Will's father. Uh, Bill. Will and yeah, Bill. Uh, and, and who was best he, friends with my dad, by the way. Fourth, that's right. Yeah. That's right. Who yeah. hired your dad to work at Sibyl Chalton? Who hired my dad to work at Sibyl Chalton in 1958? Yeah, and and so um, yeah, like it's all connected, right? But I, I saw if I saw Will Andrews in the photo. The one in the yeah. Photo. yeah. So Will, yeah, actually, Will joined the Copan project as I as I very briefly mentioned, and and he's in that black and white photo of us in Santa Fe. Yeah. And and Will, you know. That was a uh, really important Tulane project. You know, we had Tulane, we had Penn at Copan in those years. We had, you know, Bill and Barbara Fash. Uh, I was kind of floating around between all of these, as was, you know, Linda and, and Nikolai was there. And, you know, th there was just a lot of, um, uh, and Ricardo Garcia had his own excavations, you know, and so we were, we were this kind of extended team of multiple projects. Uh, Penn State was there uh, for a time, and Dave Webster was digging, uh, and they had, they had had an earlier project at Copan, so they were continuing. Uh, it, it was amazing, you know, to, to live in, in Copan Ruinas in the town there and have, you know, all the students and, and established archaeologists from four different projects, you know, Bob and Will and Bill and Barb and Ricardo and me and David Sadat, and, you know, it was just, it was quite a time in the late 80s, early 90s. I think someone uh, tied to this project has just commented saying, thanks, Dave. That's Loa Traxler. Hey, Loa. Uh, and yeah. the pen thread carries through with Steve Houston, who, of course, that is under that's right. that pen. That's, that's very true. I, yeah, I didn't mention this. Steve Houston was Bob Scherer's undergraduate student at Penn. You know, so th there's a flow chart somebody somewhere has to make yeah. of all these uh, associations. And myself being the student of Marcello, who was a student of uh, Bob, oh, Bob, I guess right. I, I have right. some, some grandfathership uh, uh, inheritance from there. Um, okay, we have another question here. Um, uh, Alvaro MD says, thanks a lot for your presentation. It was great. Given your experience through the, the development of the discipline, where do you see Maya studies going in the next five to 10 years? Also, what would be an up-to-date book on Maya political history. Well, I, I think I think one. I think the oh yeah. The, well, I can answer. I'll, I'll answer that second question. It, it it's getting a little out of date because it's about a month old now. But <laughs> yes, a month. Uh, old. Simon Martin's book uh, on Maya political history. I think it's called Ancient Maya. Ancient, ancient Maya, Maya politics. 
yeah, yeah ancient, ancient Maya, Maya Poppies. Poppies. Well, it's so new, I can't even remember the. <laughs> uh, but it, it's it's a tremendous work. Uh, I don't want to embarrass Simon, who may be listening, but I'll embarrass him. I think it's uh, it, it, it's a very expensive book, unfortunately, but it, it's one of the most important books to come out in the last few decades. It's mm-hmm. it's a crystallization of Simon's very sensitive analysis of of Maya geopolitics and political history. Um, now, it, it's not a narrative history of Maya kingdoms, right? Um, I, I will mention that, uh, you know, the Chronicle of Maya Kings and Queens, mm-hmm. uh, you know, book that many of us have, it's now, you know, a couple of decades old, but, you know, that, that was transformational, of course. It, it brought together a lot of data we had all been working on. Mm-hmm. And, uh, just a few months ago, I signed a book contract with Princeton Press to write a, uh, a book called The Ancient Maya, A New History. And oh, it's going okay. to be a, uh, po- a popular, accessible, uh, I hope, uh, narrative of, of, of the classic Maya. Uh, but, but looking at not just the kings and queens, but, you know, looking at, at broader issues as well. Um, so uh, I'm in the midst of all of that right now. Uh, it should yeah. be out in a couple of years. I think that another good book too is uh, not as recent, but Antonia Foyas' uh, mm-hmm. uh, take on on uh, uh, classic Maya politics is also very good as well. Yeah. Uh, but so yeah, to go back to part of the, the, the top is the top part of the question though is given your uh, <laughs> given your experience through the oh where we're going uh, yeah where do you see Maya studies going? Uh, five you know, years I, I think young, we're oh. well. I mean, this is a very hard time for everybody, including Maya archaeologists who can't go to the field in any time soon. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this affects all of us uh, in terms of field work and supporting students and getting other projects going. And I, I don't even want to imagine that. But um, I think, um, you know, look, as I was kind of racing to say at the end, I, I think we're at a very healthy place in Maya studies. The, the, the arguments and the tensions, and, and you know, I, I probably downplayed that. Uh, you know, in, 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 19, in the 1970s and 80s between um, a number of archaeologists who were trained to be skeptical of history, right, to be skeptical of, of, of the written word, uh, yeah. to be skeptical of, of you know, quote-unquote propaganda and so forth, right? Uh, I, I, I get that. I understand that. And, and it comes out, as I was saying, of this Americanist archaeological intellectual history. Um, very different from from people trained in England or trained in in Europe. Uh, But in America, if you're studying archaeology, history has nothing to do with it, right? You're studying, you know, Lou Benford and bison kills, and you're studying, you know, some other, you know, I'm I'm exaggerating, right? But what I'm saying is that a lot of my archaeologists who who dived into Maya material were just, I think, um, not trained. Uh, I don't want to use that word necessarily, but they, they were not, history just had no role to play in, in intellectually in what they were looking at. Actually, um, Dave, there's a perfect question that just ties perfectly into this, this point you're making. Yeah. So uh, Miguel Pimenta Silva says, it was a fantastic presentation as always, Dr. Stewart. I would like to ask you, can you talk a little about the relationship with other European epigraphers of your generation, so, such as Alfonso La Cadena, Eric Bolt, yeah. Nikolai Gruber, and Dmitry yeah. Believ? Yeah. Many others in the 90s. Thank you so much. Right. No, great question. So, yeah, I was giving my kind of very particular biographical kind of sketch here, right? So, uh, Nikolai joined us in Copan, and in, 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 in I met him in one of the Mesas Redondas, I think in 86 or so. Uh, and he came to Copan very quickly after that. Um, and, you know, he was clearly looking at this in much the same way, right? He was, he, his approach to things w- was very similar. Um, and, and one of the things I should mention is that in the 70s, right, There's- uh, the Yale School, which is sort of what created the, the, the methods we use now, or, or I don't know what to call it, the North American school, some people have said, you know, um, th- there was a school of epigraphy in Germany in those years, Thomas Bartel and, you know, and, and others that was really not about phoneticism. They didn't agree with anything Konorosov did. The other thing I want to mention is there was a Russian school of epigraphy, we might say, 
in the 70s and 80s that was Konorozov and his students and his followers that had nothing to do with the epigraphy we do today. Um, I don't think I'm exaggerating that. <laughs> Despite the fact that Konorozov had made those breakthroughs in the 1950s, identifying syllabic writing, if you took an inscription that Konorozov was translating in 1980 or 19, in the 1970s, uh, in one that, that, that we were working on, they would have looked like apples and oranges. Uh, it's fascinating, right? So I guess the point I'm making is, is that there were some very uh, innovative uh, and rather independent thinking young scholars like Nikolai uh, and Alfonso as well, La Cadena, who, who, you know, came to the Texas meetings who were uh, in those years, um, you know, pre-internet, let's remember, right? Th this is how you communicated with, you know, sort of physically having to come to places like Austin. And, and you know, that was what I think fostered a lot of the ideas and methods we, we, we assume today, right? So many of us who teach courses on Maya glyphs, we all teach the same stuff. We teach it all the same way, pretty much. I mean, we all agree on pretty much everything. Uh, it, it, that's remarkable in and of itself, but um, I didn't quite make this point. In, in, in the 1980s, that would not have been the case. Um, and, and I think it's a very healthy sign for our field. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the European, uh, the energy from, from a lot of the younger and, and or contemporary with me European scholars uh, was, was tremendous and, and vital. And, and well now, you know, uh, there's uh, a synergy that, that's global in terms of, of my uh, uh, glyph studies. I wonder if maybe in 10 years, we also will get a much more kind of subtle, uh, subtle understanding of kind of the more um, heterogeneous landscape of the uh, classic Maya through uh, linguistic yeah. work, for example, and through increased uh, uh, survey and archeological work that will really give us a better idea of how yeah. complex this geopolitical landscape was and, and integrated in a way that that will be reflected in, 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 in popular books where we won't really talk about the ancient Maya, but really the ancient Maya, Mayas as these, these myriads of, of, of states. Yeah. Well, this is what I'm struggling with. You know, when, when I signed this book contract, you know, on my history, I was like, oh shit, you know, because how do you, how do you write this as an, as a cohesive narrative when you have, you know, Palenque, you have Akbalam, you have, you know, Kupan, and, and, and how do you weave that together? Well, you can't necessarily. There, there, there are threads you can track between all of that from time to time, but um, it, it's not a single historical uh, narrative that they're producing for others to read. It's very eclectic. It's very, um, it's the same writing system. It, it, it's they're, they're keyed into each other, but but all history is local in, mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, right? Mm -hmm. So um, uh, you especially get a sense of this up in Yucatan, right? I, we don't talk about Yucatan so much when we talk about history, but you know, look at Tipo Chaltun. We have you know important dynastic records there, Ekbalam, mm. Koba, you know. Uh, I, I just in terms of the future, I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's I, I don't. I don't have the, the magic glasses to look forward like that, but I think we're in a healthy place because A, we agree on the fundamentals. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you're an epigrapher now, you're, you agree with how to read this stuff, you know? Um, and I, I have to remind myself from time to time how special that is, you know, that, that the stuff that we were doing um, in the, in the seventies and eighties is now like, it's common knowledge, but it's just, it's just assumed knowledge. It's like, you don't even think twice about it. Right. But we were struggling with the basics in, in 1983, you know, uh, and you know, um, how the, how the structure of the script actually worked. And this is why we had these different approaches, you know, whether it was in Moscow or in, in Germany or, or here, in the States, um, you know, there was just a lot of disagreement, arguments in the, in the Mesas Redondas mm -hmm. uh, early on, you know. And I guess 
something else where we'll have, there's a very strong rising uh, scholarship in Latin America as well. For Absolutely. Papers, yeah. so I think also we'll get some more uh, perhaps localized. Uh, well, that's what I mean by being global is we have tremendous scholars in, in Mexico and Guatemala. Uh, and again, you know, colleagues who are pushing in, in brand new directions uh, everywhere. You know, I, I'm a, I'm an old fogey now. You know, I'm I'm one of the old, <laughs> the old set. <laughs> you don't look too old. And it's like you know, but um, it, it's it part of that Not is troubling. Maybe it. part of that's kind of like wait a minute, you know. But but it's also wonderful. It's wonderful to see um, that it's vibrant and and it's there there are people I don't even know very well who are reading my hieroglyphs and making insights. Mm -hmm. You know, which which is kind of weird for me to say because 20, 30 years ago, we all knew each other. Like it was this sort of tight group or, or you know, uh, we were sending letters to each other, you know, mailing them, typing them on a typewriter and mailing them off to Steve House. Mm -hmm. it, it, that, was, that was how we communicated back in the day. Well, so. thank you so much, uh, Dave, uh, for this presentation. Yeah. I think this was great. A very good retrospective, I guess, on the, the past uh, two cartoons of... Uh, of my uh, uh, epigraphy and the marriage with archaeology, which gives us, uh, I guess, um, what Simon Martin has called archaeopolitics in some ways or other ways. Yeah, yeah. My archaeology. Uh, so this is this is wonderful.